Let's kick off our America's Vote 2024 coverage with a look at polls that are now closed across several states. Polls closed at 6 p.m. in Indiana and in the eastern part of Kentucky. And the following polls just closed at 7 p.m. Florida, the key battleground state of Georgia, Indiana, Central Kentucky, South Carolina, Virginia, and Vermont. This is sure to be an historic election. I'm Drew Petromo. And I'm Michael Schnell, and we're your hosts for America's Vote 2024 here at The Hill. And who better to kick off our five-hour live coverage this evening than The Hill's editor-in-chief, Bob Cusack, and our national politics reporter, Julia Manchester. Bob, Julia, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Bob, we'll start with you. Have you ever covered a presidential election quite like the one <laughs> we are on the precipice of finding out about tonight? Uh, no. I mean, obviously covered uh, and interviewed Trump when he first ran in 2015-2016. Uh, so you've seen a different flavor, and he has upended the Republican Party. There is no doubt about it. Whether you like Trump or you hate him, books are going to be written about him for hundreds of years. He could make history tonight, could be the first president uh, since Grover Cleveland to lose, to win, and then lose, and then win again. Uh, we shall see. But it's—I just don't know who's going to win this race. And usually when you get up on Election Day, you know who's going to win. Right. And anyone who says they know for sure— they're wrong. <laughs> Julia, these campaigns are about big ideas and themes. What do you think we're going to learn tonight, and what might we not learn tonight? Look, in terms of what we will learn, I'm curious to see if we will see abortion rights, reproductive health, that surge that Democrats saw in 2022 and in 2023 in Virginia, if that continues. We are seeing exit polling showing it is a high priority for voters, but Republicans have told me, despite a lot of voters putting abortion access over the economy in 2022, they think at this point the economy will trump abortion access, no pun intended. <laughs> um, but also, we're, all, we're looking at immigration. We know that the Trump campaign has hammered Harris and the Biden administration relentlessly on that issue. That's another issue that in 2022 Republicans campaigned on, but it couldn't beat out abortion access. So we'll be watching for that. And Bob, the main card tonight, obviously, the presidential race, but there are some key tight contests for control of the House, control of the Senate. Now, the House more of a toss up than the Senate yeah. is, but give us the state of play on what's up for grabs on Capitol Hill tonight. Well, the quest for the majority goes through New York and California two years years ago, Democrats did better than anticipated in the midterms. But to Julia's point on abortion, uh, that helped them avoid the red wave. So while Republicans and the crime message worked in New York, it didn't work uh, nationwide. But a lot of those Republicans now are in trouble because it's a presidential election year. The turnout is higher. Uh, so Democrats are feeling pretty good. And honestly, I think there's a lot of pressure on Democrats, especially after January 6th, especially after the chaos of the last couple of years of a small majority. And and Republicans didn't have a speaker right. for three weeks. So if you're not going to win the House back when you just got to win a handful of seats, that would be kind of embarrassing for Democrats if they don't do it. Mm -hmm. We are getting some information in from exit polling. According to that, Harris, voter, Harris supporters favor democracy and, the abor and abortion as the top issues. For Trump supporters, it's the economy and immigration. Is there anything that we can glean from this, or should we take that information and throw it in a trash can because exit polls <laughs> don't mean anything? I don't think um, any surprise, really. We know that Harris has been working to turn out her voters on, and she frames it as freedom, the freedom for a woman to get that reproductive health care, um, you know, the freedom uh, that's involved in democracy. We know that Trump really prioritizing the economy and immigration. I am curious, once we get more of these results from independent voters in terms of the exit polling, what that shows. But there is another interesting exit poll I came across from NBC News. We talk so much about the demographic divides in this country, or in this country, but also in this campaign. We know that the Trump campaign has been working really hard to peel away Latino men, young Latino men, and young black men. Well, I'm looking uh, at this exit poll. He's, in terms of their, uh, Latinos say they are 42 percent favorable of Donald Trump. That's up from 38 percent in 2020. And among black Americans uh, in 2020, they were 10 percent said they had a favorable view. That's 14 percent today. So that trend is starting to hold. I would like to watch Hispanic and Latino voters in particular, because we know that they have been steadily moving maybe more towards the center, more towards Trump. Yeah, and Bob, even on that point about Hispanic and Latino voters, uh, they have been sort of 
thrust into the forefront of this campaign after former President Trump's uh, rally at Madison Square yes. Garden in New York with that comedian that made disparaging comments about Puerto Rico during, again, the rally billed as something associated with the Trump campaign. Do you expect to see there be any electoral consequences for that? Because the Trump campaign having to play some serious cleanup following that rally. Yeah, and they usually don't clean up anything. Right. Uh, and they did have to clean that up. And listen, this could come down to 10,000 votes in Pennsylvania or another battleground state. So every little bit matters. I think a couple weeks ago, Trump was looking better I, as far as closing arguments. I think Harris won. I don't know what Trump's strategy was down the stretch. He wasn't appealing to independents. He already has the base, where she, I think, smartly in the last couple of days, uh, was was trying to do, have a more uplifting message, not even mentioning Trump by name. I think that was a winning strategy. At the same time, I think Harris has been awfully cautious with her media strategy. Mm -hmm. And when she did do a media blitz, it didn't work. Harris has been trying to peel off moderate Republicans. She's made this a major theme of her campaign. She's been campaigning with Liz Cheney. What do you think of the strategy to try to target those moderate Republicans? Are we getting any signs that that could be successful? And if she isn't able to, quote, you know, quote, unquote, win the burbs, is that a major problem for her campaign? Yeah, look, it is. She needs to win the suburbs. I think independent swing v women, they're always, um, you know, one of the biggest swing groups, if not, you know, a major, uh, you know, the deciding factor in elections. But in terms of moderate Republican women, even some conservative Republican women, there have been some indications, you know, some hopeful indications for her. There was, of course, that Ann Seltzer poll out of Iowa that showed her lead, on that. Yeah, leading 35 points among women over 65. I mean, women over 65, this is, that's normally a conservative sure. voting block. Um, independent women by 28 points. This is in Iowa. This is a state that recently implemented a six-week abortion ban for the, on most abortions in the state. A lot of Democrats and some Republicans I talked to said this could be a reaction to that abortion ban. I am curious, um, you know, in some of the states States out west, I believe Arizona has a, uh, or Nevada has a um, abortion amendment on the ballot. How that impacts the turnout in the presidential race as well. A lot of folks tonight going to be deciding. Well, was that Ann Seltzer poll an outlier, or did she actually hit it on the nose in terms of figuring out the dynamics here? Bob, let's also talk about the Senate briefly because yeah. the Senate sort of is a little more baked in than the House in terms of what forecasters predict. It looks like Republicans have a good chance of taking the majority. It's the the nature of the map this cycle, break down what that looks like. Yeah, uh, Republicans have a great map, uh, but they also had a pretty good map two years ago, That's true. and they blew it with bad candidates like Herschel Walker and others. Okay. But Mitch McConnell famously saying candidate quality. Yeah, candidate cycle. quality. They've got better candidates, but at the same time, incumbents are very difficult to beat. I think Tester in Montana, in Montana is in trouble. Manchin is not running for re-election. Uh, uh, Republicans will definitely win that seat tonight. So therefore, uh, how do Democrats hold on to the Senate? Well, they hope it's a late night where their incumbents are holding on, maybe Sherrod Brown, can, who's a very good candidate, but he's in the red state of uh, Ohio. I, I think no matter what, when you look at the House and Senate, when it's all said and done, we may not know the House, as you've written, uh, for, for weeks. Two weeks. It, it could be a while, but I think we're looking at narrow majorities, and r without a doubt, Republicans are favored to win the Senate, and I think we're probably going to know that tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about, more about the House. You have these races in California and also in New York, where a lot of times Republicans are trying to defend vulnerable seats, sometimes seats that Biden won in 2020. What do you make of the race for those key states that are going to determine the control of the House in New York and California? It's going to be difficult for a lot of these candidates because they have Trump at the top of the ballot, um, you know, and sometimes they have Trumpian candidates further up the ballot, um, you, know, you know, in some cases. So it's going to be difficult for them. They're walking a very fine line. And you also see it, um, you know, just across the river in Virginia and Virginia 10 and Virginia 7. Those should be lean Democratic state uh, seats, I should say, but they're, they've been toss-ups. I mean, I still think Democrats are likely to win them. We'll see. But they've been rated as toss-ups. So, you know, that's that's uh, that's a pretty telling sign, I think, about how, you know, vulnerable some of these seats are. Yeah, Bob, there's been a lot of talk also this cycle about the disaffected Republican. We saw Nikki Haley, even after she dropped out of the race, get significant support in the primary. She ended up endorsing former President Trump. And then you had Liz Cheney, a conservative icon, one of the top Republicans in the House for years. Uh, endorse Kamala Harris. It has been such a fascinating campaign. 
How do you think that Liz Cheney effect is going to impact this race? And when we saw those exit polls about democracy being the top issue for, for Harris voters, did that closing argument maybe break through? Because democracy wasn't ranking high in terms of importance of issues for weeks in this cycle. Yeah, I, I think Liz Cheney move, and that argument moves the needle a little bit, but not a lot. I think these endorsements, and now we have Tulsi Gabbard, former Democrat, supporting right. Trump and other Democrats uh, supporting uh, Trump. You see Republicans. I talked to uh, former Congressman Jim Greenwood this week. He's supporting Harris. He's from Pennsylvania. He's not even sure which way Pennsylvania is going to go. So this is something that uh, I, I do think uh, it's negligible. I, I do think endorsements matter, but only when, when they're at the level of Elon Musk or Taylor Swift. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, we will come right back. We actually have some key right now. Vice President Kamala Harris has won the state of Vermont, and former President Trump has won Kentucky, South Carolina, and Indiana. Virginia, results are rolling in, but that is too early to call right now. Julia, early results, nothing too shocking. Democratic states, Republican states, but can we just take a moment? We find we have the first states called in the 2024 election. Yeah, no, I mean, it's unsurprising that Harris has won Vermont, Trump has won South Carolina. I am curious to look at Virginia and really to dive into Virginia. We know that Virginia is, of course, a blue-leaning state, but it was a state that prior to Biden dropping out, um, tr Donald Trump was targeting. He also had a rally in Virginia on Saturday night. Right. Remember, um, Virginia has a pretty contested gubernatorial election mm -hmm. next year. So I think even though Harris is likely favored to win Virginia, Tim Kaine will likely win re-election in that state. I think there are clues that you can kind of pinpoint from Virginia that you could apply to other parts of the country the suburban um, part of Virginia, for example. How enthusiastic are women sure. in that part? Rural voters, what does that uh, look like? There's parts of Virginia that are quite close to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Is there any crossover there? So we'll be watching for that. Well, and yeah, Trump had a rally in, in Virginia recently, right? He's been making that a focus of his campaign, whether it's a bluff or not. You know, we don't know inside what they're really thinking, but, you know, he's has this notion that maybe Virginia would be in play, maybe a place like New Mexico. He's kind of trying to put out this signal that he's expanding the map. Is that something, is that real? Uh, well, I, I've talked to some Republicans who, who kind of were shaking their head why he's doing this, uh, why he's going to states he's yeah, probably not going to win. At the same time, if science. he wins Virginia, this thing's over. I mean, if he wins New Hampshire, this thing's over. And if she wins Iowa, this thing's over in her direction. All right, Bob Cusack, Julia Manchester, we will check back in with you later when we have awesome. some more numbers to chew over. Thanks so much for getting us started. Thank Thanks. And joining us now and all night with coverage of the state and local level are Nexstar's national live stream host, Chip Brewster, and founder and editor of Pluribus News, Reed Wilson. Chuck, Reed, Chip, Reed, thank you so much for joining us. What are you guys looking for in tonight's race? Well, uh, I'll tell you that, first of all, on the tech side of things, this is pretty exciting for me because we have AP maps that are feeding us live information. So let me go ahead and bring up one of those that is showing the full state thing. And what this enables us to do, what really, I'm going to be honest, enables Reed to do is take control of that and dig into that data. And I know we're looking at, again, AP results, not decision desk mm -hmm. results, but you specifically wanted to call it Indiana. Yeah, Chip, I want to show you uh, some good news for Vice President Harris and some good news for former former President Trump here. Okay. We're going to zoom into Indiana, a state that President, former President Trump has already won. But let's take a look at Hamilton County here, the suburbs just north of Indianapolis. You can see that Vice President Harris leading there, uh, yeah. leading uh, former President Trump there uh, by a uh, small margin, about uh, 1,300 votes. This is a, a difference because back in 2020, four years ago, uh, former President Trump carried Hamilton County by seven points, 52 to 45. So this tells me that mm. there's some movement in the suburbs mm -hmm. in a state like Indiana, even if it's moving uh, for President Trump. So now, though she won't take Indiana, obviously. She, she won't take Indiana, but if Hamilton County, if, if those suburbs are moving, then I think we're likely to see uh, suburbs move in other states. Now, let's uh, talk about some good news for former President yes. Trump here, moving to, uh, to Florida. Of course, a key state, his home state, uh, where he's uh, he's watching these results tonight. Uh, let's take a look at Broward County, a big Democratic uh, vote uh, vote sink here. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Harris leading there 61 to 39 percent. Uh, that's not enough. In 2020, uh, when oh. former Vice President, now President Biden, uh, lost Florida, uh, he carried 64, almost 64 and a half percent uh, in Broward County. So that tells me there's a little softness in Florida. Now, let's remember, Florida always gets a disproportionate share of the attention because it's one of the first big swing states to close. So 
you know, let's not read too much into that. Vice President Harris doesn't need Florida on her path to 270. That sign in, in Hamilton County may be showing the suburbs moving a different way. Uh, in some of those Rust Belt states, that could be big in Wisconsin, in Michigan, Pennsylvania, the states that are really going to decide this. But I figured we'd show some good news for Vice President Harris, some good news for former President yeah, Trump. Yeah, now let me also show, just because I want people to know some of the capabilities that we have here. So this is a cool map that gives us that full country, enables us to zoom in. But we can also look at specifically swing states and really go state by state. You were just talking about the ones that are going to make the difference. So yeah. we will have that data from the Associated Press here. We have balance of power maps. I'll put this one up full of the Senate. That is something that we're watching, of course. We have House balance of power. That's going to be an ongoing thing. Yeah. We may not know the actual balance of the power there. But then speaking of the House, we have a very similar thing as far as the districts across the country. So, yes, Reed and I are here to dive into that data, and we're going to be using this system to do that, hopefully be able to bring you guys answers to some of those questions that you have. I already heard some talk about Virginia, so we'll start looking into that data as it comes in and hopefully be able to give you that true inside analysis throughout the night as the true balance of power is determined here on election night. All right, very exciting. Thank you, Chip Brewster and Reed Wilson. And now, Decision Desk Kenny HQ can project that independent Senator Bernie Sanders has won re election in the state of Vermont. This is going to be Bernie Sanders' fourth term serving in the United States Senate. He is, of course, an independent senator, but he caucuses with Democrats. And stick around, we will be right back with more America's Vote 2024 special election coverage. And welcome back to America's Vote 2024. Joining us now is The Hill's White House reporter, Brett Samuels. Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Tell me, how did former President Trump spend his final day of campaigning, potentially ever, because he said that this is likely his last campaign? Yeah, so we saw the former president, he went and voted at his polling place in Florida, where he talked to reporters. Somebody asked him if this would be his last campaign, even if he lost, and he said pretty much that this was probably it for him. So certainly a lot of uh, legacy potentially on the line for Trump tonight. Uh, so he voted, he talked to reporters. He's also been making calls. He called into uh, some local radio stations in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, trying to urge people at the last minute to get out and vote. And he's done a lot of uh, pushing people to stay in line, essentially saying, if you're in line to vote, stay in line to vote. So clearly the former president and his campaign really trying to push this across the finish line, make sure they have the turnout that they're looking for in these battleground states. Mm -hmm. He's also, you know, trying to take in this, what he thinks is going to happen, is, is do you think that there's a lot of confidence coming from the Trump team? Do they think they're going to win? We've read some stories over the past few weeks about disarray inside of the campaign. What's your take on the level of confidence among the Trump folks? Certainly, I think there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of confidence. The word that I kept hearing from Trump allies when I would talk to them is uh, cautiously optimistic. It's everyone's favorite phrase these days. Absolutely, yeah. It's an easy way to kind of hedge your bets. <laughs> um, you know, they're cautiously optimistic. They feel like the issues are on their side. They feel like, you know, people say the country's in the wrong, headed in the wrong direction. That bodes well for him because he's the challenger. But at the same time, I think there is an acknowledgement. There's sort of this sense of anxiety, maybe unease, that after that Madison Square Garden rally that we saw about 10 days ago, that ever since then, uh, momentum is sort of been on the Harris campaign side. So, uh, you know, with that cautious optimism comes this sort of sense of uncertainty that maybe uh, things are sort of trending against them at the last minute here. Mm -hmm. All right, Brett, we'll hold it right there because joining us now from West Palm Beach, Florida, where former President Donald Trump is holding his election night watch party, we're joined by News Nation Washington correspondent Rashad Hudson. Rashad, what is the energy like in the ground there in West Palm Beach right now? Hey, good evening to you. We're here at the West Palm Beach Convention Center where you can see behind me former President Trump supporters are starting to file into the room. Now, many of them are being handed those the MAGA t-shirts and hats, that MAGA-branded merch. Now, they're all excited. Many of them are from all over the country. They're here, and soon they're going to be locked into the monitors to watch those results start to come in. Rashad, what do you expect from Trump tonight? Is he actually be coming over there? Where is he watching the returns? And kind of who's surrounding him on this final day uh, as he watches these re returns come in? 
Yeah, like many Americans, former President Trump is at home. He's at Mar-a-Lago watching the results come in. He's with his family. We do expect at some point, though, whether the former president comes here to the convention center, we do expect him at some point to address his supporters. He's watching closely, though, as those results come in. He's posting online that he's going to have a big victory. Now, of course, that's a social media post, and now it's in the hands of voters across this country. And Rashad, do we know uh, who the former president is with tonight? Do we know if his closest advisors around him, his family is around him, who he's talking to uh, in these you know, moments when we're waiting for the returns? Yeah, a lot of those advisors, including Stephen Miller, who's a longtime Trump advisor, is posting online, posting confidence. They're all given confidence. And many of the people here in this room, they're feeling confident as well. A small crowd, but we are told that the former president is at Mar-a-Lago and he's surrounded by his family watching these results come in. All right, Rashad Hudson, we'll check in back with you later. Thanks so much for joining us. Brett, you have covered Trump for years. This is his third presidential campaign. What do you think uh, was different this time around? Yeah, certainly I think, uh, you know, coming off that 2020 defeat, there was this sense of, uh, you know, the question of whether he would run again, what his message would be, would voters uh, continue to back him uh, like they did in his first two presidential can campaigns. Uh, certainly we saw he remained very popular with the GOP. There was this, obviously this underlying current of him not only running for the White House, but potentially running, uh, you know, for his uh, for his freedom, essentially his personal freedom, given that he was under indictment in these multiple legal cases. Um, and then I would say that his message has been, at times, you know, uh, echoes of 2016, where he had this sort of shock value. He was saying these very controversial, inflammatory things. We've seen, especially in the closing days of this campaign, where he's, you know, he's attacking his opponents in in uh, very sort of. Uh, incendiary terms. He's, he's talking about being women's protector, whether they like it or not. Um, he's talking about immigrants and wanting to see, you know, Penn State athletes wrestling immigrants. Uh, so it's been sort of a throwback to the sort of freewheeling style of Trump in 2016. And the question is, has that worn thin on people? Is there, after almost 10 years in the spotlight, is there this Trump fatigue that has set in with the electorate? Yeah, and Brett, while we're here, we are monitoring the results as they roll in. As we mentioned, at 7 o'clock, Georgia polls close. If we can throw up the map right now of where things Stand that general returns map. Kamala Harris has a slight lead, 51.2 percent. Donald Trump with 48.4 percent. Now that's just three percent of the votes in, so by no means it's a lot, not a lot. But talk about the importance of Georgia in terms of Donald Trump's path to victory. Of course, he won it in 2016, and then Joe Biden won it in 2020. Absolutely. Georgia, I think it's fair to say in 2024, is pretty much a must win for the Trump campaign. If Trump is losing Georgia, it's hard to see him, you know, winning multiple states in the blue wall that he would need to offset that loss. Um, the Trump campaign from folks who I've talked to, the states that they felt the best about when it came to battleground states were Georgia and Arizona. Those were the two states that they really felt like Trump had sort of the best standing in, that he was going to do the best in. Uh, we saw him rally in Georgia in the closing days of this campaign over the weekend. Obviously, Vice President Harris also held a rally uh, in the state as well. But certainly, you know, early returns, as you said, you know, too soon to, to declare a winner either way. But Georgia is a state that the Trump campaign certainly expected to be in their column. And if it's not, that does not bode well for him for the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. Trump's been sending some mixed messages when it comes to whether or not he's going to accept the results of this race, kind of signaling that if it goes his way, it's a fair election. If it doesn't, maybe it's not. What do you expect to see from Trump throughout the night? And does that depend on how the returns come in? I think it definitely does depend on how returns come in. You know, as you said, Drew, he's been asked multiple times during this campaign, will you accept these election results uh, regardless of the outcome? And his go-to is always something to the effect of, you know, if it's honest. And it's like, well, what does honest mean? Essentially, it means does, is he's a winner? Like, that's what honest A message is. that's been also echoed on Capitol Hill by some of Donald Trump's closest allies right, in the Republican right. conference. Absolutely, yeah. And so that's, I think, a big concern for Trump's critics. We heard John Bolton, a former national security advisor for Trump, essentially say he expects Trump to come out around 10 o'clock at night and say that, you know, he won the election. But certainly I think a lot of it does depend on the election returns. Certainly he did this in 2020 before Georgia and Pennsylvania were called, and those two states were really razor close and ballots were still being counted. Uh, if the election is really tight in those states again, I would be surprised if we don't see Donald Trump come out and say something uh, 
you know, either declaring victory, asserting that he's ahead or something. Uh, certainly if Harris is sweeping these battleground states, that makes it a lot harder for him. It makes it a lot harder, as Michael said, for these, uh, these Republican allies to kind of go along with it with any credibility. But uh, I would point out we've already seen in Philadelphia a couple city officials, both Republican and Democrat, pushing back early on Trump's claims of potential fraud uh, that he has pushed in that city. Yeah, and, and Brett, you alluded to it earlier, but let's talk about, dive into the closing message a little bit. Uh, to, you know, I would assume that Trump campaign officials wanted to focus on the economy, wanted to focus on immigration, two issues that Republicans have this leg up on. But we saw the former president in the final stretch veer into more of this personal vendetta message. Uh, what are you hearing from Trump campaign officials? Were they frustrated? by that? Was the former president working off the playbook that they were not in line with? Certainly, I think you saw at some of the former president's rallies, for those who watched them, you know, he would always open with this line that he wants to ask the crowd a simple question, are you better off than you were four mm -hmm. years ago? And that's the message that they right. wanted to drive home, sure. are you better off? The problem is that, you know, for the final week, we weren't talking about our voters better off than they were four years ago, uh, or this, you know, Kamala broke it, Trump can fix it message that they tried to push at the end. Instead, you know, we were talking about all these self-created controversies, whether it was the Madison Square Garden rally and this racist joke about Puerto Rico. Uh, we were talking about whether RFK Jr. would be given free reign to, you know, mm -hmm. roll back vaccine approvals. We were talking about Trump's violent rhetoric about Liz Cheney or about the press that he that he talked about at one of these rallies in North Carolina over the weekend. So certainly this is a sort of a classic case of you have, you know, the, the quote-unquote discipline of the Trump mm -hmm. campaign campaign where they're pushing this message that resonates with voters, but then you have the candidate himself who just seems to really struggle uh, to go at each other. Message. Yeah. Absolutely. In conflict. The Trump campaign has made a major focus trying to drive up the vote among men, especially young men. They've been doing all these podcasts, both he and J.D. Vance. And I've been seeing on social media today, a lot of conservative commentators are basically telling all the men to drag their friends to the polls and make sure that they vote. Is that just sticking with the strategy that they've had? Or is there some worry in the Trump, uh, on the Trump camp that the, the female vote, women are voting in such high numbers, and they really have to match that, and it's a tall task. Yeah, this was always a concern, I think, with Trump campaign allies was, you know, this is the first presidential election since Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court. So we have not yet seen, you know, just how big of an impact that will have. But certainly, polling has consistently shown this huge gender gap that Kamala Harris performs very well with women. Women typically make up the majority of the electorate. They, they are more reliable voters at getting to the polls. So the Trump campaign, they had this edge with men and with young men. They've really tried to appeal to them. Uh, and the idea is that young men are these, quote unquote, low propensity voters. They are voters who maybe haven't voted in the past. Uh, uh, but, and they're not as reliable, but if you get them to the polls, that's a way to create an edge. The problem with that is, of course, they are low propensity <laughs> voters. They're not reliable voters to get to the polls. Uh, so we've seen Charlie Kirk, a Trump ally on social media, you know, highlighting lines of men waiting to vote. We've seen Stephen Miller, a, a senior Trump advisor, uh, posting to say, you know, that men need to get to the polls in battleground states before they close. So clearly, I think this is a sign that the Trump campaign is banking, you know, maybe not their entire, putting all their eggs in this basket, but they are banking to some degree on men turning out in strong numbers to kind of offset the advantage that we expect to see Harris have with women voters. Turnout always has, seems to be the name of the game. So they say. Yeah. Brad Samuels, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you in a little bit. And joining us now is Washington correspondent Hannah Brandt, who's at Howard University at Vice President Kamala Harris's election watch party. Uh, Hannah, how are you doing? And can we expect to see Harris tonight? Hey, Michael, Drew, I'm doing great. They just started letting supporters in behind me. They're expecting about 2,000 people to be here tonight. The music is playing, and yes, we certainly are expecting Vice President Kamala Harris to show up here later herself. What is the mood like there from Harris supporters? Are they optimistic that this is gonna be a good night for them? You know, it's very early, we're just getting a few returns in, but what are you sensing? Yeah, I'd certainly say optimism, hope here in the audience. Among the campaign, we've heard a bit from them that they're seeing some strong signs of enthusiasm. One of the things they pointed to is a lot of votes from college students, specifically in states that they really need to win, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Wisconsin. They say they're seeing lines one to two hours long. And what they're doing is they're telling those students stay in line. They're even having some of their campaign surrogates, celebrities like Demi Lovato and Jennifer Garner call, FaceTime those students to tell them to stay in line, keep that enthusiasm strong. So they're certainly feeling good about what they're seeing there. And how, where is the vice president right now? Do we know where she's watching the returns and who she's watching them with? 
Well, she did some radio interviews earlier today in which she said that before she headed here to Howard University that she plans to eat dinner at home with her family. In fact, she said there are people staying with her at her house. I can't even imagine running a campaign while also hosting family members. But she said having dinner with family on nights like these is a tradition for her. So I can only assume at this time of night that that's what she's doing. But we're certainly keeping an eye on when she plans to head over here. Yeah, and Hannah, I'm wondering, uh, as you look at the crowd there, how big, how many people are expected to be out there? Are they going to have different, you know, musical acts or anything like that? What's, what's the, on the agenda for that celebration? Yeah, we're still waiting for a run down here, but we're seeing supporters already start to trickle and it's getting pretty crowded here behind me. They're expecting about 2000 people. They say a lot of, of course, students and staff from Howard University. This location obviously very significant for the vice president. This is her alma mater. And so there's certainly a lot of pride on campus having one of their own run for president. And so that's a, a part of this crowd, certainly, and a part of the mood here tonight. All right, Hannah Brandt, thank you so much. We'll check back in with you later. And we're going to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because there's a lot more to come on America's Vote 2024. Welcome back to America's Vote 2024. Joining us now, The Hill senior editor, Jesse Burns, and staff writer, Niall Stanage. Niall, let's start with you. As we start to get some of these returns in, what are the first things you're going to be looking for to give us an indication of how this is going? To not look at returns when there's 3%. <laughs> I think it's representative of anything. Look, you know, election... Easier said than done. I, yeah, I mean, I've done a few election nights at this point. One of the dangers is extrapolating too fast for whatever numbers are available. We'll get the results in. Yes, certainly we can look at things like turnout as those results build out. I think obviously whether uh, the, uh, there's a larger proportion of female voters than normal, that would seem to be a good sign for Vice President Harris. If it happens, black turnout will be crucial to her. But we are in a period of sort of realignment in American politics where exactly the same demographics aren't, we don't think, going to vote in exactly the same way as they have done previously. Yeah, and Jesse, what are you watching for tonight? What are going to be your first instincts when these numbers roll in? Yeah, I, I think realizing the fact that we are more than likely going to have divided government. And even though the House and the White House are basically a coin flip, how is this changing the uh, electorate at large? Are we seeing more divisiveness across the country? Are we seeing places where Republicans have run up the score and are doing that? Uh, or are we seeing the country essentially uh, trying to become more moderate on some of these issues? And so um, I think we've seen two election cycles in a row where Democrats have had an edge. Abortion has been a driving factor. Uh, are we going to see that for a third election? And are we going to see both parties essentially walk away from the end of the night saying maybe we need to modulate a little bit more? Now, looking at returns that are coming in from Florida right now, 72 percent of votes in it says Donald Trump is up nine points in mm -hmm. Florida. That would seem to me to be a good sign early, very early. Yeah. But in a state that does report pretty quickly, that they, uh, they tabulate their early vote and mail-in vote quickly. Yeah, that's a pretty mar big margin, at least at this point in Florida. It is, and I think that Florida is particularly important for another reason as well, which is that there is a, a, an abortion-related ballot measure happening in Florida. So if Trump holds on to a nine-point margin, that would be slightly above his polling averages. The differential in Florida was about six points. If he, in fact, is doing better than that, that would suggest that abortion is not having the salience that the Harris campaign hoped it would have in driving people to the polls. Or if it is driving some people to the polls, it has been neutralized, perhaps by strong pro-Trump turnout from rural areas or something to that effect. Yeah, Jesse, I wanted to also dive in with the, this, this impact of women's reproductive rights with you. Uh, abortion's on the ballot in 10 states this cycle, including Florida, as we mentioned, Nevada and Arizona, those three being key battleground states. Can we glean what we say in Florida for other states, or should we take it with a grain of salt? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that Florida is becoming increasingly red, right? We're seeing a lot of people from New York and other places travel to Florida. They're relocating there, redomiciling. So, uh, you know, Trump won it by, I think, two points in 2016. He won it by three or four points uh, four years ago. Uh, so, you know, it's it's trending his direction. Uh, but to echo Niall's point, yes, if abortion is not a salient in a place like Florida, uh, that could have ramifications for other places. And as we all know, going into tonight, this election in some of these places within the margin of error, more than likely in a couple in several of these states. And so uh, even though uh, abortion is not the very top of the of the itemized list for 
for, for voters, the economy is still very much at mm -hmm. the top. Uh, it is still etching away at those top three uh, spaces. And so I, I think that Trump, it definitely neutralizes him on the issue of immigration. Uh, he is winning on immigration. Harris is winning on abortion. Sure. And then they're duking it out over essentially the economony. Could I just pick up on Please. Jesse's point very briefly? One of the dangers of, of extrapolating too early from numbers is that right now we have different exit polls saying different things. Yes. So for example, on the abortion issue, so there's one exit poll that says that more voters rate that above immigration as a driving issue. And there's a different exit poll saying the exact opposite. And th that question could actually be really pivotal. If this election ends up having been determined in a large number of voters' minds by immigration, Donald Trump's going to win. I mean, it's his strongest issue right. by far. He's had a leg up on it all it, cycle. The entire time by like 20 points. If, on the other hand, abortion does end up driving a large number of votes, then Kamala Harris is going to win because she it's the mirror image of immigration. Right. She has a massive advantage on that topic. Sure. Yeah, I wonder if there's some voters out there that kind of want to have their cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. They could vote on an amendment like in Florida to protect abortion rights, but then also maybe vote their pocketbook for somebody like Donald Trump in the same state. We could see something like that maybe in Arizona, Nevada, these other states where abortion is important. And there's a significant portion of the population that's saying, I want both. And I think as the night goes on, watching these Senate races play out too, places like Ohio, Trump is going to win Ohio, but there's a very competitive Senate race in Ohio. Uh, places like Pennsylvania, another example where the top of the ticket and the bottom of the ticket are not potentially going to be in alignment. And so you might have some of these more moderate voters who say, hey, I'm going to pull the lever for Trump, but maybe I want to pull the lever for a Democratic Senate candidate to have that divided government. So on the issue of abortion or uh, price gouging, other topics that these two sides are going after each other uh, come January, uh, there might be some type of moderation. The most obvious example there being Arizona, where Ruben Gallego, the Democrat, is running some points ahead of Carrie Lake. But among the battlegrounds, it's in fact Trump's strongest. It's the one that he's up by more than two points. Right. Fascinating situation right now. We're going to see it shakes out. Niall Stainage, Jesse Burns, we will definitely have you back. Niall, when we have more numbers so we can chew over them a little bit better. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And now let's bring in The Hill's staff writer, Rafael Bernal. Rafael, the elephant in the room right now, of course, is what happened at Trump's Madison Square Garden rally um, when that comedian made disparaging joke about Puerto Rico. Are we seeing any electoral impact so far from these early exit polls from that rally? Yeah, the question really is if that comment uh, energized Puerto Rican voters. I took a look at the preliminary and very preliminary voting results from Puerto Rico, and I get the impression that, yes, they are having an effect. Uh, Kamala Harris is, has received, with about 30 percent of votes counted, 248,000 votes. And statehood, the, the, the concept of statehood, is the second most voted you know, candidate or idea, with 173,000 votes. That indicates to me that support for Harris is really high among Puerto Ricans and among Puerto Ricans with a tie to the island. And let's remember, a lot of these people voting on the island, their, their, their presidential vote doesn't count, by the way. It's just a sort of an academic exercise. But they are talking to their relative stateside in states like Florida and Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania and North Carolina is where this vote might be crucial. Yeah, and Raphael, uh, maybe on the other side of that of the that pendulum, uh, I'm following a race, and I don't know, we might be able to pull this up, but Osceola County in Florida. It's a very interesting county. Uh, it's one of the highest Puerto Rican populations in any county in the United States, the highest in Florida. A third of the citizens are Puerto Rican. It was a Clinton plus 24 district in 2016, a Biden thir plus 13 district hmm. in, 26, in 2020. Right now, I'm just looking at the returns with 23% reporting. It's basically even. So, you know, that could be something unique to Florida, but it's definitely an interesting data point when it comes to the Puerto Rican, how they've reacted to really both campaigns. Yeah, Central Florida, uh, let's remember, Ron DeSantis captured about 50 percent of that Puerto Rican vote. So what, what happens often in central Florida is Puerto Rican voters don't participate as much. And I think what the Harris campaign was, was hoping for is that these not so much undecided on who they support, but undecided on whether they're going to vote, that they would come out strongly for, for Harris. That We're seeing that in, uh, in Puerto Rico, in, the, in this sort of mock election they're having for president. And, and the Harris campaign is basically banking that we will see that among Pennsylvania's Puerto Ricans. But yeah, I don't think hopes were too high for, uh, for the Florida crowd. 
Well, thank you, Rafael Bernal, and uh, we'll definitely check back with you with you later in the night. Pleasure. Joining us now is the Hills Race and Politics reporter Cheyenne Daniels. Kamala Harris is having her election night party at Howard University. Cheyenne, uh, if you're with us, what's the symbolism there? And Cheyenne, Kamala Harris can, of course, make history here, being the first African-American woman to hold the presidency. But she hasn't made that a key theme of her presidential campaign. She hasn't really called on those identity politics. Talk to us about how she has spoken about race throughout this election. All right, Cheyenne Daniels, we're going to try to work on your audio. We'll get you back in a little bit, hopefully. Thank you so much for joining us. And let's bring in Rachel Janfanza from Up and Up. She covers Gen Z political culture and all things related to young voters in U.S. politics. When it comes to these votes, we're always talking about turnout. Um, are there any indications if that turnout is high with the youth vote this cycle? So we saw in these early numbers of, uh, from the early vote that high youth voter turnout in some battle states in Wisconsin, Dane County in particular. There was an uptick in youth turnout there after um, after the vice president's rally last week. Uh, and um, but beyond that, uh, it is a little too early to tell in terms of how the uh, early vote is going. Though we are hearing that um, in Georgia, there's been a on par levels with 2020 in the early vote, um, and in North Carolina, there was some high uh, early vote youth turnout in some of the college towns there as well. And Rachel, the gender divide may be the most pronounced among young voters, with young men backing former President Trump largely, young women flocking to Kamala Harris' side. Can you talk about that dynamic breakdown, what that gender gap looks like among young voters this cycle? Yes. So I've been in Pennsylvania for the past week. I've been talking with young voters every day. And it is so clear when you ask young women what are the top issues on your mind, they list abortion access, women's rights, reproductive health care. And for them, they say it feels really personal that this election is about them, that they're fighting for their futures. When you talk to young men, while there are young men who are prioritizing abortion access or women's rights, I've had young men tell me they don't feel it's as intrinsic to them, uh, that it's not their body. And so I think that's part of this. At the same time, over the past, really since the, the start of the Trump era, uh, data has shown young women moving rapidly to the left, while young men have sort of plateaued in terms of staying pretty moderate. Uh, while young women are able to rally around this unifying issue of women's rights and reproductive health care access, young men don't have a singular issue that they're rallying behind. And I think that's in large part why we see young women moving to the left, whereas young men are just pretty much staying as they have been. All right, Rachel, thank you so much. I now want to break in with some key race calls from Decision Desk HQ. Decision Desk HQ now projecting that North Carolina is at this moment too close to call. Former President Trump, though, has won the state of West Virginia. And Ohio Senate race between incumbent Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown and Republican Bernie Moreno, that one too close to call. And when we come back, Rising's Robbie Suave and Namiki Cox will give their insights into what they expect to see with tonight's results. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Hill special election coverage. I am Robbie Suave, host of Rising, and it is election night, and we are still waiting for a lot of results, obviously. We've seen some early news from Georgia, North Carolina, a couple other places, but there's still a lot of votes to be counted. One thing I noticed so far was Stephanie Cutter, advisor to the Harris campaign, had an interesting turn of phrase when discussing what's going on with the Harris campaign. Let's play that. Okay, uh, we don't have that actually, but what she said- Live TV. We were going to install Kamala Harris as the president rather than vote for her. I thought that was an interesting choice of words. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting choice of words, but it also shows the confidence 
I have it. I have. I'm a little uneasy about it, even though my predictions are that she Your will have a landslide. Were very confident. If we want to uh, return to those from this morning, we, you said that you thought Kamala Harris was going to win Texas and Florida by slight margins. We're right now. I'm, 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 well, I'm looking right now. Right now, we are still. It's it's 54-45 in in Florida, and we don't have all of our votes in. Some major cities haven't come in yet. I mean, that's what you wait for. Is these major cities take longer to pull up their votes? Uh, Orlando it has a large Puerto Rican population. Uh, we'll see if the Boricos turn out for Kamala Harris in in response to Donald Trump. Listen, it's still tight. I said Texas and Florida could be Democratic. I will repeat the promise I made to you this morning, where if <laughs> Those two states go for Kamala Harris. I will wear a White Dudes for Harris t-shirt on Rising I love the next that. day. I'll, That's I'll, my promise. I'll have it signed by the White Dudes for Wonderful. Harris. Wonderful. The guy's organizing. Can't wait for that. One other thing I'm looking at, I, I, I think there's been some conversation about Charlie Kirk, who has, is based in Arizona and Phoenix, where I started off organizing myself. And he, his organization has been outsourced to do uh, voter turnout. And he said, turnout's down. We need some folks to yes. turn out. Yes. He said he was bringing some of that doom and gloom the Democrats are always bringing to their side. <laughs> We're so far behind. We need you to you know, send money. We need you to register. We need you to sign up your everybody who lives in your neighborhood. The end is nigh. Whereas Republicans have so far liked to lean into, we're winning, everything's great, um, which is just the strategy they've employed. But I also saw that, that uh, statement from Charlie Kirk um, encouraging uh, people to get out there. Uh, we also had, uh, who was it on the on the uh, one of the Trump um, uh, advisor people saying I'm forgetting what his name was uh, one of the Bannon acolyte people saying um, men go out and vote just men just <laughs> go out and vote we don't want any of you lady voters we don't know what you're gonna do in the poll not, not even what your husband tells you to do probably <laughs> they've been watching those ads Julia Roberts got to them yes that was it um, you know and, and, and of course Elon Musk was also working on organizing with his his America pack yes. it's a strategy I'm actually curious why they went that way do you think it has something to do with the RNC there might be some some differential opinions I mean there has some some strategic differences saying you know Donald Trump you need to expand beyond on the white male vote and start talking to other groups. Well, it was Elon Musk who actually told Trump this time around this whole uh, ignore mail-in ballots, ignore that kind of thing strategy, you know, tell your people not to vote except to vote in person. Stop doing that. It's bad. There was reporting, I think from the New York Times, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, as Elon started becoming more involved with the Trump campaign and then has now become the facilitator <laughs> of the get out to vote drive, the ground game, um, told Trump, you know, you can't just do that. You have to get ahead on the, the mail-in voting and the other, the other things as well. And so if Trump does win, um, e Elon is... Elon will have changed the oh, shape of elections dramatically. Uh, having one very wealthy and powerful financier do it for you, and um, and, and then also Elon might be taking a, some kind of role in the administration I, if he. I'm skeptical of that. I think he has too many other projects. He and there's the Hatch Act. He can't be involved in too many things, especially when it comes to his NASA program. Well, as I've said before, I want him involved in the NASA more than I want him wasting his time in the White House or even running a, a social media app. He's going to get us to. I want a Mars colony, Elon. That's what uh, that's what the voters really <laughs> I do too, uh, care so about. Can go live there. Yeah, but we'll uh, see if. Uh, but other people who have you know jumped onto the Trump campaign in recent weeks, Tulsi Gabbard, RFK Jr., um, Ron, uh, Ron Paul got some attention today from Elon Musk and uh, Donald Trump people. Uh, so that you know that could be an, that's an interesting assortment of not traditional Republican voices at all. Obviously, Tulsi Gabbard coming from the far left of the Democratic Party, RFK Jr. Democratic Party, then independent, um, Ron Paul combative with the yeah. Republican Party for decades, calling them big spenders and neoconservative warmongers, all those things. Uh, meanwhile, the Democratic coalition now includes the Cheney family. Yes, and Bernie Sanders, and Bernie who Sanders just won his re-election for U.S. Senate, so let's give him a shout out. Yeah. Uh, one more term, I guess. I don't know how many more turns. I, I think what's interesting to me about Elon Musk is he seems to be the only person who Donald Trump listens to. It's like billionaire to billionaire. Uh, you know, he, he, he loves Twitter just like, or X just like Donald mm -hmm. Trump does. So maybe that's the secret is what he has been saying has not been anything that Republicans haven't said. And in Arizona, you know, speaking of Charlie Kirk, they have a long tradition of mail-in voting and early voting. It is not something that came about after uh, COVID. It was something that occurred before. And so he was saying, you know, plenty of Republicans were saying, don't don't criticize this. You might need it. And it helped him in 2020, I think, as well. So maybe he's the whisperer. I mean, I do. Had, <laughs> I don't I, like I what he's whispering. The voices that Trump has leaned on this time um, Elon Musk, Bill Ackman, Tulsi Gabbard, RFK Jr., a bunch of other people. 
and, and, ha and kept at bay or had more marginal folks like Steve Bannon, well, he was Margaret in jail, Taylor to be Green, fair. et cetera. <laughs> he just got out. Good. I think it's, you <laughs> know. hard to send him a message well, through the phone line that cuts out 30 seconds. I think, in. dare I say it, the Trump campaign has demonstrated some discipline in bringing in interesting and provocative and contrarian, certainly people, but who appeal more to independent podcast crowd, maybe a male crowd, whatever it is. But Trump has to find new voters somewhere. Right. And that's what they tried to do with this strategy. It might not work. But um, in some ways, I think this is a better run campaign than uh, either of his other campaigns. I don't know about better run. I guess we'll see. I, I do we'll think see. he had an issue in that his coalition was shrinking drastically, and he needed to find new voters. And uh, he was already appealing to some of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, we saw the shift over the last year. Now, Kamala Harris, on the other hand, I, I'm curious how her message, if she were to win, which I hope she will, and I think she will. Um, how her message well, with Florida and Texas, she's guaranteed the, <laughs> the top prize. All right, uh, Texas look, she's, right now. She's running a, an effective campaign. As, I mean, look, there, there's no way around it. She was thrust into this position, installed. I would, I would certainly use that Stephanie. word for the how she got the Democratic <laughs> nominee uh, uh, argument. And she has not made any major mistakes. I think she's been maybe too cautious at some turns. But she successfully renounced her unpopular political positions without sending to not super plugged in people the sign that she had flip flopped and uh, and that has you know made the race I think what it is a 50 50 dead even oh. split and we're gonna start finding out not right now but in the next couple hours tonight we're gonna find out uh, who is actually gonna prevail you know right now all the it's just all the people Wait. on social media saying yeah there's so much enthusiasm or I talked to eight Kamal people or I talked to 10 Trump people and it's you don't know because it's uh, just Frank, anecdotal. Frank once said uh, you know about five minutes ago what we said in our studio when we interviewed uh, one of our, our colleagues Federico de Jesus like a month and a half ago, that it was going to come down to the Puerto Rican mm -hmm. vote, and that was before the speech at Madison Square Gardens. I think it's Garden. I think it's also women. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're seeing the dynamics there. So I'm just curious what the margins are going to be if Donald Trump is going to peel off any women in that that final stretch that he wasn't already going to get, and just how large that Puerto Rican, Boricua vote, mm -hmm. and Latino vote all together is, is going to be. And if it's going One to be. thing uh, to mention before we go, so the Republicans have had an official Senate pickup in Jim Justice. Uh, that means Baby Dog heading to the to the Senate uh, building. Baby Dog, a very famous figure <laughs> at the Republican National Convention. This adorable little bulldog that uh, Jim Justice <laughs> takes everywhere, who is great, and I think uh, probably Baby Dog should just do the voting. He should probably, exactly. He or she, I should, should not misgender this dog. It's a Baby female dog, dog yes. I think, yes. Well. So that was some exciting <laughs> news. Uh, we'll kick it back now to the Hills live election coverage. America Votes, stay tuned for more.